Hello everybody and welcome to this We Create EDU Hangout. I'm Jacqueline. I also run a channel called SciJoy where we do hands-on science and I have a bunch of guests with me tonight. Today I have Chelsea. Hi everyone, I'm Chelsea. I run a channel called Practical Poppins which is a nannying parenting channel um, in which I talk about kids and my nanny life. And here we also have Kyle. Uh, maybe he can't hear us. Kyle, can you hear us? Yes, I can. It's a slight delay. Sorry. Yeah, excellent. Uh, That's all right. We're, we want to hear you. So tell us about yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Kyle Sullivan. I, I can hear you, but there's a, there's a slight delay. Are you... What, what window do you have open? Do you have us playing in the background, too? Let's see. Let's see. I do not. Hmm. I do not. I don't understand. One second technical problem. Uh, technical difficulties. Technical difficulty. But there is a great deal of... We need Google Hangouts strikes again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do I see? How do I... And at some point, they're going to try and merge this with um, Google Live, I think, is what Draw Curiosity oh, told us in the Slack. Mm. But I don't know if the Live one lets you have multiple people on it, which is an issue for us. Mm -hmm. Well, if they're merging the two, maybe they'll keep good parts from everything and just kind of <laughs> smush it. But, you know, be great. one can hope. <laughs> And if anybody has questions once we start this going, I will. I think both of us are watching the comment section. I think sure. Ryan's video is going to be in the comments. So, mm -hmm. oh, Matt's in the comments. Hey, Matt. Hi, Matt. We Hello, a, Matt. We had a coffee shop with Matt the other day, where we just all worked on stuff together, and Matt taught us some interesting things, like you can listen to Wikipedia being made. Yeah, that's the coolest website ever. If anybody doesn't know about this, it is freaking awesome. Let me see if I can find it. And now Brian, I'm gonna lose the hangout. <laughs> and Brian from American Venture Survival Science is also here. Oh, well, hey, Brian! Welcome back from Alaska. Woo I think he's gonna try and join again. Nice. It's okay. We hangouts usually. A little bit glitchy. It's alright. We'll we we are chill here. Is it any better? Hello. Hey. We can hear ya. Can you uh, hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Are we still no. delayed? No. Oh, okay. Excellent. No idea what that was about, but I just shut everything down and brought it back up. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Excellent problem solving. Yeah. Just turn it off and turn it on. <laughs> Fixes 99% of the problems. Uh, right, so where were we? You guys were just chatting. Uh, yes, tell us about yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm Kyle Sullivan. I'm a videographer slash filmmaker. I live in Birmingham, Alabama. I have a, uh, a couple of YouTube channels, two to three, depending on who you ask. And um, I like making content around interesting real-life topics. Most of the time, except for the Star Trek stuff. <laughs> so, so what are your favorite real-life topics to cover? Um, let's see. I uh, have degrees in anthropology and smattering of biology stuff, so I love the life sciences. I love uh, animals, organisms, evolution, things of that nature. I like anything cultural, anything linguistic. Uh, oh. And... I'm very comfortable in history, too, so, you know, half of all human endeavors. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And those are the kind of topics I like to make videos on, typically, so. Cool, so you've got a decent breadth of information that you can pull from, too. That's quite nice. I hope so. If not, I am literate, and that's usually half the battle. <laughs> True. Very, very good point. <clears throat> 
I found Kyle through the Creators Guild, and he posted his video. I don't remember the exact title, but it had Antarctica and dinosaurs in the title, I believe. And I clicked on it, and it was hysterical and wonderful. And then I learned about your big adventure you're going to go on to Antarctica soon. How did that start? Like, what made you want to do that? And did you you had to apply to a grant or a contest? Right. Um, it, it's a contest through a company called Oceanwide Expeditions, a northern uh, European company. They do voyages to the Arctic and to the Antarctic. Um, this contest was their biggest prize package, and I think probably one of their largest uh, like purchased items that you can buy from them. And it's uh, a month, 30, 30 something days, uh, around a quarter of Antarctica. So you, you leave from New Zealand, and you go all the way around the continent, up the Antarctic Peninsula, and you finish at the bottom of South America. Wow. Um, I've always been interested in Antarctica. As a kid, I was the space nut. You know, I, I memorized all the details of the Apollo missions and the space shuttle. I, the part of history that I enjoy the most is the, you know, contact pre-colonial, you know, when people were really knitting the planet together and all those tales of, of, of new things being uncovered. And so Antarctica is like the last slice of that, really. I mean, we have it mapped. We kind of know most of what's there, but not really. You know, as the ice is melting, you know, new stuff is literally popping up, and uh, the interior isn't as well known as it is. So it's like the last really undiscovered land, and that's really what drew me to it. And I just randomly Googled this contest and randomly entered, and now I'm, I'm going for 30-something days. Wow. How does one prepare for something like that? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, not one clue, and I'm going to talk about that uh, to some degree in the videos. But none, none. I, I, uh, I live in Alabama. I barely know what cold weather is like. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I did see in one of your videos you talked about possibly putting your equipment in your freezer to try and see, like, because <laughs> yeah, you're going to be filming the entire thing. Yes. Yeah, some of the, the continent, um, the environment around Antarctica is really hostile, like mm. an overzealous serial killer. It's, <laughs> gonna, it's not only going to try to kill you, but probably your equipment too. Mm. And I've already talked to a number of people who have done uh, work in extreme environments as wildlife photographers, and uh, they, they caution against the extreme cold with camera gear. So I already knew I'd have some specialized... Either the gear has to be completely specialized or some behaviors or, you know, subsidiary gear. Like, if there's extra steps, extra stuff you have to get. Right. And I'm still figuring out what the right solution is uh, for how to, how to capture some footage and not break my, my gear. Right. Bring lots of extra things in your pack, but then that adds more weight to your pack. Right, yeah. right. Costs more money to like, down there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you bring, like, insulation for your... Camera, insulation for your lenses, things like that that you can use while you shoot. Is that a thing? That is exactly a thing. Uh, they Ooh. make little lens jackets, apparently. I, I had no idea until I started looking this up. Um, oh, that's awesome. yeah. From North Face. <laughs> 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 Thank you for laughing at that nerdy joke. <laughs> no, no, that's it's good. I was just imagining a North Face logo. <laughs> right? yes. And uh, thinking that North Face is missing an opportunity for sponsorship. They really are. So, North Face, if you're watching, this is where you need to be. We'll right. tweak them this later. <laughs> <laughs> wow, so do you have, like, little jackets for your lenses and for your, you know, camera bodies and stuff? No. Um, not yet, at least. I suspect I'll get some, but uh, one guy told me that your camera gear mostly survives in extreme cold weather. It's just when you go to change lenses. Uh, moisture gets trapped in the space between the lens and the sensor, and mm. it'll freeze. And if it freezes while you're changing it outside, the camera is right, done. You're just screwed. Yeah. So it, it's like those are the moments you're protecting against. Normally, if you don't disconnect the camera, maybe you're fine. Hmm, that's interesting. And the brand of camera matters a lot. Canon probably lasts a lot longer than the gear, the studio gear that I use. So I'm I'm slowly trying to figure out uh, and read. There's not a there's not a one stop guide to this stuff. Uh, which has been the hardest part. Mm -hmm. uh, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? Right, and how many people have actually done, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of really freezing cold photography and filmography as well? Right. Hmm, that's interesting. I think the only uh, time NASA has used... 
So. Okay. I'll be so back for a second. <laughs> froze for a second. Um, I thought the because uh, you were talking about extreme temperatures, and I was trying to think like, does NASA have a lot of research on this? But I think the only time they used it probably outside was back when they were on the moon. Because I think most of the time now, for at least the astronauts, they take it from the inside and they they take pictures of people on EVAs. You don't really see them these guys with cameras. And Curiosity probably has some cold ones, but they're probably a lot more expensive in different gear than what you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, the gear that NASA deploys, like for Curiosity, for example, is highly specialized, um, UV resistant, this kind of stuff. Uh, pre, like the way your cell phone camera is made, it's like the complete package and a little kind of tiny disk, and they put everything you need to know in there, and then they put in another additional housing that's like mostly weatherproof. Curiosity's cameras are like that on steroids. This, um, it's compared to going to Mars, it's it's cheap enough to go to Antarctica or the North Pole uh, where you can take normal gear and just, you know, buy a lens jacket for it. You can take the specialized gear, but it really depends on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a documentary about his work where he was setting up these time-lapse cameras around glaciers uh, all over the planet, oh. or I think in the North Pole, actually, around Greenland. And uh, he was just trying to capture in a time-lapse fashion how the breakup of glaciers and the melting glaciers, like, so that we can have a more visceral understanding of the, how, that, how fast that process is happening. I forget the name of the documentary. It's really cool. But he left his cameras out there for months at a time, and at that point they started breaking down. Wow. If you're a National Geographic photographer and you're taking pictures of leopard seals, you can go outside for a day with your gear, with the same gear you'd probably use in New York, mostly. Um, with a few precautions, you could probably make it. Mars is cold, though. Mars is very cold. Yeah, and a little dusty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> That's and true. You're not going to be worrying about dust. You'll be worrying about snow, though. Snow. That's, yeah. that's very true. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Jacqueline. I was going to say, you said we were talking a little bit beforehand, and one of my favorite videos of yours, since I'm such a large space geek, is your Curiosity video. And you also said that was one of your favorites, so... What what about that video did you really enjoy? Uh, you're talking about the uh, machines versus Mars. Uh, let me look it up. I just remember I'm cur it was your curiosity. Curiosity, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I liked that one a lot because I had never seen anyone uh, create a narrative out of all the machines that we sent to a planet before. I went to research it, and like, I, there's just a couple of lists online. NASA's got one, and it's missing some probes. Don't tell them. Uh, Wikipedia has a full list. There's like two Wikipedia pages with the full list. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, Curiosity was such a big deal, and I was like, well, you know, we were finally getting getting into the business of exploring the Red Planet. Oh wait, how many machines have we sent there? A lot. <laughs> We've sent a lot of machines there. Yeah. But my favorite thing about that video is, you know, under coming to the realization that we've been at this Mars business for quite a while, and uh, the players who opened the door for Mars are not who you think they are. Like, the Russians were really Mars-heavy at first, in the 60s, you know? Yeah, they uh, they actually landed stuff on the moon before we got there. Yeah. They were landing rover kind of things there. Yeah. No one, at least no one in my sphere talks about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to school with all space nerds, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you know all of that. Yeah. I as well do not know any of that, so <laughs> it's okay. It's uh, 40 something machines wow. that we sent to the Red Planet, and most of them die. It's like a survival rate of like 40 something percent. And wow. uh, we've only just now become really successful at it, and it's really just the Americans. Sorry, Russia. Sorry. <laughs> Russia's better at going to Venus, though. Yes. We then, are not. <laughs> I'm actually uh, doing research on a follow-up video to that one based on Venus. Does um, Russia have, like, a rover on Venus? Yeah, so Venus is... Look, I haven't heard any of this. What? <laughs> Venus's pressure is, like, insane. 
Okay. Um, so you know how they're always talking about greenhouse gases here? Well, Venus had runaway greenhouse effect like a long time ago. Ah. So they have like sulfuric rain and the pressures are incredible. So as soon as you like put something through its atmosphere, it's slowly being crushed and just like heated up and stuff. Right. So it's it's pretty volatile. So, so not it's, so yeah. much with the curiosity on Venus. Yeah. Okay. So it, it's actually the hottest planet in the solar system. Mm-hmm. That was one of my favorite space facts from being sure. a kid. Was Mar or Mercury is closer, but Venus is hotter because of those clouds. That's fascinating. Didn't know that. Making a note. Learn more about the solar system <laughs> right now. <Yeah. laughs> Venus is insane, and uh, the the it's hot. It is the hottest planet, and that's a. Uh, it comes right down to the atmosphere. You know, just the power of having clouds and gases on your planet. Just circulating and being in there all the time. That's fascinating. And Brian said there was a, a good press conference this morning. Uh, a Mars, oh. NASA had a Mars press conference. I think, did they announce um, the 2020 rover today? Did they talk was about that? What, was that what that was? I don't know, I missed it. Yeah, I, I couldn't see it either, but I know that they're trying to do a sample return mission. That's like their me- next big goal with Mars oh, cool. is to bring some stuff back. So, do you, and one of the th- other favorite things about your project that we thought was just awesome is you're going to put all this footage to public domain. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so you guys have made videos, and you understand about how copyright works and about what happens when you stick an image on your video that you're not uh, in full control of. Mm-hmm. The thing I've discovered making videos is that there's not enough public domain stuff out there. Mm. Uh, so when this trip contest happened to me, I was like, you know what? It's fun to go, but I've got cameras all over the place, so let's uh, try to do something with this. Because what little research I've done in Antarctica, there's very little imagery out there in the public domain, especially recent imagery. And I know NASA's got a lot of stuff out, and they're usually pretty good about public domain stuff. Everything they do is public domain technically. Uh, But as far as filmmakers and videographers and and people who are interested in documentaries and making them, there's not a lot of good material out there. And the reason for that is is when filmmakers do go down there, the cost is so prohibitively expensive. And they have to make some kind of return to justify just going. You don't just go there like you go to New York and just get a street shot of Ninth Avenue. Right. Uh, you're going down there for a reason. National Geographic's usually paying for it, and uh, the footage is owned by who's ever paying for the trip. Well, this contest gives me an opportunity to not have to pay for that. Ocean White Expeditions mm-hmm. is on the hook, so to speak. So this is, I don't know, the best opportunity I, I, I can pull out of just winning a random contest online. The turn it into something that people can use. And with climate change being such a hot topic for the next, oh, I don't know, century. Mm. Um, <laughs> if we've got that long? And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people talking about it, news agencies talking about it, and a lot of times if you watch enough of it, you see they're recycling the same chunks of footage right. over and over and over and over. And uh, if you go into the online space, Wikipedia, with the Wikimedia Foundation, you know, their, their imagery is even more uh, of a small cache. So I just, I wanted to, this is a great chance to add to that and give other filmmakers and videographers a tool. Anyone who wants to make a documentary on Antarctica, for example, can take all the stuff and use it to their own justifications. That's really incredible. I think that's that's an absolutely amazing thing for you to, to want to even do with the opportunity that you have. Um, and I think whatever you get will absolutely be used. Like, I <laughs> guarantee you. Yeah. Um, and even, I mean, like, I feel like even though I am not a documentary filmmaker, the idea of you putting out public domain um, footage, photos, whatever, of Antarctica, like, makes me want to do something about Antarctica because it's just so cool. And you're right, there's not a lot of media out there that is public domain that you can use from Antarctica. It's just um, either, you know, costly prohibitive, so people need to get their return back or whatever. Um, So I think the the idea is super cool. I think it's awesome that you're going to go try and do that. I'm really excited to see what you come back with. Oh, boy. See, that raises the bar. I'm going to get there with, like, a cell phone. No, no pressure. Um, No pressure. 
Um, the if whole planet. Have a photo, it'll be cool. <laughs> the whole planet's watching. No joke. No joke. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I'm gonna do some things with it myself, but uh, I'm gonna figure out a way to release it, and I don't know where or how, and that's part of the things that mm -hmm. I'm uh, researching at the moment. Like, I could technically give it to the Wikimedia Foundation if that's how they facilitate it. I don't know where to house it. Might have to create a website and just uh, have it available for download. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I might stick it on Pond Five if you're familiar with the website. I don't know. There's that's a whole. It, it's a Wild West show as far as public domain uh, footage is concerned. Anyway. Hmm. Um, so. That's what the chat is asking about. They're very excited and they're like, "We're going to release it." And Brian says he has a bunch of footage from oh, Alaska, and uh, he would like to post that for people to use, too, but he also didn't know where to put it. Yeah. There is... Uh, okay, so Pond 5 is a big uh, house of, of footage, and you most filmmakers put, like, B-roll and snippets there, but there's a lot... They have their own public domain category, and they have a lot of it. A lot of it's really old. That's a place you can put it. Um, Wikimedia Foundation's a place you can put it, but it's hard for filmmakers to get access to those video clips. Uh, just by way of the system that they use it for. You can't just click download and get a piece of footage. Um, where else is there? There's a couple of places like Pond5, a couple of Pond5 competitors, maybe three total, that I'm aware of online where you can find access to public domain material, and it's usually the same stuff. Government reels from the 40s and uh, military bands playing tunes for you know the public or something, and... Uh, random things. There's a forest fire clip that the Forest Service recorded back in the 50s that's on Pond 5 that I've, I used in the History of Antarctica video. It's like, here's a forest fire. You know, okay, thanks. I found a way to use it, though. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. There isn't an internet-wide solution for that. I'm actually hoping the Internet Creators Guild can somehow address that or create a resource for people to at least look at and see where all the locations are. Because as far from where I'm sitting, I've just had to Google my way to, to finding public domain. Yeah. That's an excellent point. I think I've gone to archive.org. I don't even know if that's all public domain. I can't remember. But I've seen some um, a lot of footage, like you were saying, that's kind of random. I watched a video where they, they first were putting like postal codes or zip codes, I think, because they didn't have that before. And I uh, watched another one where the traffic lights weren't standardized, so sometimes red was go. <laughs> and so oh, no. And it, it went really poorly. So oh. it's kind of cool to, when you put stuff like that out there, too, that people can see how things change over time. Like some somebody in the chat was saying, it's amazing that you're doing this and filming it because you're getting even more recent footage than a lot of stuff that's out there. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. My ultimate solution will probably be uh, a standalone website, at least at the start. And if there's a good place to keep it elsewhere, I'll do that at the same time. But I might just create a website and just people can go to the website and get access to it. And they'll just have to know about it. I don't know. Well, you ha we have uh, 103 subscribers, and we will tell them all to tweet it out. <laughs> the link. Sure. Well, and I think individually we have different amounts of subscribers in different places. Yeah, so yeah. Those, that's 103 so, creators, right. and those creators have X number of followers. So. Are, you, it out there. are you guys familiar with a musician named Kevin McLeod? Mm hmm Yeah, maybe it'll be something like that. Everyone just sort of knows yeah. about him after a while. Right, yeah. Hmm. That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. I love it. I think it's great. Now I'm going to have to write a video about Antarctica just because. <laughs> Raising babies in Antarctica, that's going to be my video. <laughs> it's just going to be, you know, some sort of cartoon baby overlaid. You want, to, you want to know something interesting about that? Someone was born there. Really? There was one person born in there. In like a research facility? I think it was uh, an Argentinian or something. Oh, cool. Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I there think There you go. Like, There's where I can there, use your footage. There you go. Let's do a video about that. <laughs> Brilliant. Done. So do you have um, any filmmaking tips for us that you could... Uh, well, um, what do you want to know exactly? Loaded question. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is a loaded <laughs> question. Um, hmm. 
Hmm. When you I'm trying to think of a more specific question. So when you do all your different videos and tell your stories, how do you go about trying to f figure out the most interesting story but also being educational and creating re really good footage? Uh, it is a balance between all of that. Um, if you focused on getting the best footage of everything else, the content, the narrative might be not as exciting. So you kind of have to balance and then find out where your strengths are. I, the topics I pick based on my personal interests because, um, and this is my uh, guiding principle as a filmmaker, if I'm interested in something and it didn't exist in the world, I'm going to do that. Um, like machines versus Mars thing. No one had done that in visual form and I was like, you know, let's, let's figure out how to do this. That one was a really hard one to do actually. Um, it's basically interest driven. And then I, once I decide on the topic, it haunts my dreams and, until I figure <laughs> out a way to uh, express it. So I'll sit on an idea for a while uh, on the back burner, so to speak, of the mental stove, until I figure out like a, a kind of visual theme. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Machines vs. Mars, I used as much video game uh, canon as I could. I uh, referenced Ninja Gaiden and Super Mario Brothers and uh, this and that and this and that. And I thought that was a nice theme. That, that video is a little jumbled visually. Uh, the Venus uh, sequel, Machines vs. Venus, will have an even more unified video game theme to it. But I just, if you're talking about machines, you're talking about computers, it, it lent itself naturally. So I try to find a theme that matches the, a visual theme that matches the topic. Mm. And once I find those, then I've got something and I'll, uh, and I'll record the voiceover and go for it. But you gotta, you got to have a visual theme that matches the narrative theme, and the narrative is the most important thing. Most important thing. Yeah, we have a question from the chat, too, um, from American Inventor Survival Science, Brian. Um, he says, does Kyle ever get tired of a project when you're right in the middle of it? Yes. Every, every single <laughs> one. And what do you do to finish it? <laughs> Instead of just being like, nope, done, tired of this. Um, let's see. I, I, I get up every single day and I ask myself the same question. You know, why am I doing this? And if the answer ever changed, then I would, I would stop doing what I'm doing. But if I'm in the middle of the video, I'm in the middle of a really horrendous, horrific, I want to quit everything and just become a barista edit, like machines versus Mars was. <laughs> um, I ask myself that question right then and there, and if the answer is still the same, then I'm just like, all right, there's a way forward. You just got to break it down and figure it out. So it's a lot of like, you know, me writing on pieces of paper, breaking down problems. Mm -hmm. This interest happens a lot, especially when the topic's really hard. But I mean, why are you, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you get to a point of frustration, either step away or ask yourself the question or both. In my okay. opinion. Thanks. He also said that if you gave this public footage to Hank Green, then you would have 4,000 Nerdfighter Antarctica <laughs> videos. <laughs> uh, Probably true. Would, would they be able to use it for any reason? I don't know. I would love to give on, it to, to I think, <laughs> Go ahead. I was just going to say SciShow or Crash Course would be a better bet probably than Vlogbrothers. Crash yeah, it might be course, worth yeah. emailing them and being like, hey, I have, I'm going to have this footage, you know. Caitlin from, uh, from SciShow just joined the uh, Internet Creators Guild Slack. So she's the producer for SciShow, if you want to talk uh, to her. I, that is the best suggestion I've heard all day. Um, that is a really great suggestion. Thank you. Because I watch their stuff all the time. And uh, they do occasionally talk about topics that the footage could be useful for. They, they are doing something. I don't know if it's public because I am a patron. But they're doing something that I think they could use your footage for soon. Sasha? Uh, Crash Course. Crash they're doing course. like a world geography kind of thing. Okay. Perfect. That's perfect. I'm, I'm going to find a way to reach out. Uh, either uh, through the can, guild. Either through the guild, that's Caitlin from SciShow, or if you go onto Twitter, Crash Course Stan. 
he's the one that I think is leading the geological thing. I think it's how humans form geology or something like that. I don't think crash, it's a spoiler. Crash, crash course, course stand. stand. Yeah, it's yep. literally one like one word. Crash course. Yep. I'll do that tonight, actually. So he would he would be your best bet probably for Crash Course. He's pretty easy to contact. And um, Caitlin's the producer of SciShow Space, SciShow Regular, and SciShow Kids, I think. So she's got them all. Okay. Perfect. I'm excited about that, actually. I'm going to reach out to all kinds of people in that department. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to see your footage everywhere. It's going to be oh, awesome. Okay. They're going to make a McDonald's uh, Mick Antarctica out of it. It'll be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Made of penguin meat. <laughs> the bun will be black and white. The coolest thing about this, this whole Antarctica thing, is that I'm meeting scientists who've spent years down there. A couple of videos you might have seen have uh, a couple of uh, researchers in there. I've been, they've been really excited for me, and they've agreed to do a number of interviews. I'm working on an oh, interview wow. right now with uh, Dr. James McClintock, 30-year veteran, author of two or three books. Uh, about all that stuff, uh, about something he discovered like two or three decades ago regarding a sea butterfly, a kind of sea snail. Oh, cool. Editing that the coolest thing. But going there is going to be awesome, but meeting people who do actual research and have actual stories to tell, that is irreplaceable as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's going to be incredible. That's a once-in-a-lifetime experience, that's for sure. So how many... How many people are usually down there at one time? You know? well, it varies. Uh, the summertime is the most populated. It's the most uh, conducive to human existence. Uh, several thousand during the summertime. The largest station, I think, is McMurdo, uh, which is the, an American station, and it's sort of like the New York of Antarctica. And I think in the summertime they have like 2,000 people. But in the wintertime, you get a really small subset of that overwintering, they call it. Mm. And uh, I think it's just a couple of hundred or less. I might be really wrong about that number, but not many people stay there for six months of total darkness at the bottom of the planet. Yeah, right. <laughs> not, Understandably. Not everyone, <laughs> not everyone can do it. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Mm. You said it was the New York. I just pictured like these ice sculpture skyscrapers that everyone <laughs> lived in. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> It has. It's the biggest station. It has the most buildings, I think, and uh, uh, a lot of research goes on there. But the other stations are much, much smaller. Hmm. Two thousand people is a lot more than I had even pictured were there. It's a lot of people. In the summer, yeah, it's amazing. I had thought it was only a couple hundred. Year it's a lot of people. Uh, Antarctica is really strange. You know, they have all these people down there, but there's no nation. Hmm. Uh, culture. A thing I'm really interested about is how all of these different people from all these different countries uh, are in these places and how they're like going on about their days. Most of them are scientists, so mm -hmm. there's a certain sort of camaraderie and a sort of shared international cultural, you know, thing that's happening just among scientists. Right. But if you look online, they do some pretty weird stuff down there. Like they have costume contests. There's a film festival that happens there. <laughs> uh, no way. It's like a 48-hour film festival or something like that, and they just each station is in charge of its own film, and they've got some crazy ones. Some of them are online. They, they have bands that meet up and just do a couple of things. Whoever can play an instrument gets into the band, and they do this. It's so strange. That's so cool. You know, like any other place on the earth, hum, human-wise. Right. And Brian asked um, if there is initiations. He says, don't the scientists do the club of the 100 degrees club or something where they run out in like negative 40 degrees in the nude? <laughs> I've heard I've heard of that. Uh, the Kiwis and I guess the Americans are prone to do stuff like that. <laughs> uh, I've seen some footage where people uh, have gone, what's the polar bear channel challenge? Mm, uh, polar bear plunge? Yeah. 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 No, that's not happening. No. Um, <laughs> no. Right. That's the first thing to say when you get there. No. <laughs> not do that. Not doing that. Sorry. Oh, I'll touch the penguins. I'm not getting in the water. No. Ground rules. Got to have boundaries. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I know that um, the Mars Society, we, they have a place out in Utah that's supposed to simulate, like, Martian area. I think they also wanted to have a station down there if they don't already because they wanted to kind of simulate 
like what would it be like to be in isolation? And I think the problem with that one is just so expensive to get supplies there. And it's just a, a like small society of people trying to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really, really expensive. Uh, funny that should pop up. I hadn't heard of that in real life, but uh, a science fiction author named Kim Stanley Robinson doing that in preparation for Mars in his book Red Mars. So all the characters practiced in Antarctica before they got on the ship and went to Mars. Oh, that's cool. Interesting. Cool. I'm trying to look up if it was, where it was. I know it, I've been to the one in Utah, but I heard about the one that's, I believe, in Antarctica they're doing. Just to study how humans would act. Just like you said, if you're down there for that many months by yourself in darkness. Right. That's the killer, right, is the darkness. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's what really makes you crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you can get used to the cold, you can get used to the penguins, but the darkness, it's just, oh, yeah. Uh, there's a, another documentary called Antarctica, A Year on the Ice. Uh, it was done by uh, a New Zealander, mm -hmm. a guy who's been down there a bunch, and he specifically documents an overwinter experience and what people do. And they kind of celebrate, you know, the last time you see the sun, the la the, when the sun pops up for the first time. They have, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Right, you got to um, mark time somehow and keep yourself going somehow, yeah. Keeping people, you know, in check and right. having something to fill your time, having routines, and, like, it, it's really appears to be very challenging. I, uh, again, would not be able to do that. Right. Yeah, me neither. I mean, when it gets dark at 5 p.m. in the winter um, here in Pennsylvania, I'm like, no! Nope. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing if they had more questions. Matt just agrees that those are committed people because they can stay out there in the cold temperatures for that long. Do you have different like eating habits or anything you have to do when you get down there because it's so cold? Uh, I don't know. Um, like calorie load probably? Yeah. yeah. I think it's a little... You have probably more choices than an astronaut would have, but I guess it's probably... But they have... The bigger stations, I don't know about the really tiny ones, but like McMurdo has a, a cafeteria and people sign up uh, and volunteer to go down there to be cooks just for the experience of being in Antarctica. And so they have people cooking and stuff like that. So I guess you have access to pretty decent food. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't imagine there's a chance to overeat or, I don't know, eat some really terrible junk food or something. Yeah. Well, if it's like a thing where, um, you know, <laughs> so this is a weird example, but <laughs> I grew up in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, where they do Civil War reenactments in 100-degree weather in July, which is insane in full wool coats and pants and all of this regalia. And they change their diets. They consume 5,000 calories a day and drink like four gallons of water because they're outside in 100 degree weather and they're just sweating everything out because they're out on the field for hours at a time. So I think, I think maybe is there like when you're in extreme cold, do you have to compensate for that calorie-wise because your body's shivering, or is that not a thing because you're mostly inside and you're insulated? That is a really great question, and you know what? There might be a video topic up there. Calorie consumption at the polls. There you go. Because I went to a museum, I don't remember what museum, and they had like people that were researchers in a, like, an extremely cold area, and they like ate sticks of butter in like all their meals. Right, to like, keep of, all the fat yeah, in their bodies. To, and, yeah. Because they were, to regulate their body temperature, their body was like using so much of their, their calorie consumption. Wow. A stick yeah. of butter. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> just, just like so, a popsicle. But I think this was like this was like early people oh, right. that were going there that were just like, I don't know, just bring butter with you. <laughs> <laughs> like they probably didn't have things that we have. We'll have butter and seal tonight. <laughs> and there's no exceptions. <laughs> butter is the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. Man, I would just come back and be like, where is the fruit and vegetables, guys? <laughs> That's a good question. I'm going to ask uh, these scientists here at UAB about that, Dr. McClintock especially. They're going to be able to tell me because 30 years, surely 
they know the answer to that one. Yeah, right, if they've been there for a while. Yeah, that's a great one. Thank you. Just ask how many sticks of butter they have in their bunk. <laughs> they're going to be like, what are you talking about? And you're like, well, I was on this hangout with these YouTubers. <laughs> I, was, I was on YouTube, you know, listen, butter, trust me, Dr. McClintock, butter. <laughs> They say in Gettysburg they just eat 5,000 <laughs> right. calories before they put on wool and go out and fake shoot each other. So <laughs> It's true, and it's all choreographed, and, I mean, it's a whole thing. Hmm. Uh, people have their niches, right? <laughs> I don't personally understand it, but go people who have their niches. <laughs> the costumes are pretty cool, though, I have to say. Hey, I was uh, working on a film uh, last month or something, a Civil War uh, drama, and they a lot of the extras were reenactors, and they showed up in the full get-up, and yeah. you could tell the difference between the reenactors and the actors. The actors are goofing off, telling jokes, not ready, not mm -hmm. in costume, and the reenactors are like, they get out of the car, and they're ready. And oh, they yeah, they're into it the whole <laughs> yeah. time. Yeah. They're stone-faced, they're talking mm -hmm. in accent, they're sweating already. I'm just like, man, you guys are serious. Oh yeah, they're hardcore. They, you know, they got the like the swords and the hats, and the some of them stay in tents in the fields. They don't even stay like in hotels. They go and stay in the tents, and it's hardcore. It's impressive. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Brian says in Alaska, the term for old time um, frontiersmen was sourdoughs because they would trek in the wilderness with a sourdough um, dough ball in their armpit, oh. <laughs> and they can just make sourdough the whole time. Interesting. It's kind of smart. Yeah. They keep the bacteria cultured in the relative warmth of your armpit. Yeah, right. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's one way to go. Yeah. <laughs> I would just think somebody's playing a trick on me if I'm like the first time I go out there and they're like, yeah, just stick this dough under your armpit. You'll survive. <laughs> You'll be fine. You're uh, the first person you meet is like, here, have some sourdough. It's like an Alaska ha hazing ritual. <laughs> right. right. They, they have a thing in Alabama, maybe it's in Pennsylvania too, snipe hunting. No, I've never heard of that. Uh, they, If you're new to the area, someone will take you out in the woods to hunt for a small bird called a snipe, and they'll get you to wait at the end of a ditch or something while they scare the birds toward you. Mm. Uh, but really, they'll just put you in place and then leave you out there. It's uh, a... <laughs> So it's that real good uh, gullible haze in yeah. there. It's, it's uh, many a northerner, I imagine, has been burned by this. <laughs> good to know. Yeah, thanks for the tip when I come to Alabama. <laughs> <clears throat> I will uh, not be some... fooled. <laughs> uh, so everyone in the text comment section is uh, are all creators, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. What is like the biggest challenge on everyone's plate right now as far as creating content for YouTube? I would guess most people are going to say time. <laughs> time? I think because of a lot, a lot of us are still quite small creators, um, we all, myself included, have full-time jobs still. So trying to make time to actually make quality content and script and film and edit and all that stuff on top of a more than 40-hour-a-week job is hard. Yes. Balancing output with video quality. Mm. Yes. Good. Yes. That's a thing I've discovered. Yeah. Um, you, you can keep tweaking it and tweaking it and yeah. tweaking it, increasing the quality, but then no one will ever watch it. Making the call, when is it good enough for other people, other humans to watch it, that, that's actually really tough. We were having a conversation about that earlier this week in the Slack um, where we were talking about 80-20, so what what gives you your 80%? Mm. So if you're not quite, you know, 100% there, like just, just push it out so you're, you're going to grow your subscriber base, you're going to be consistent, things like that. So maybe it's not perfect, but you got to figure mm -hmm. out what gives you the most, like, bang for your buck. True. Mm, Matt Falca says access to creative spaces. Like if you don't have a lot of the equipment, um, a lot of the creative spaces have walls with, especially YouTube spaces, like you have to have 10,000 creators to use all of their equipment. But by yeah. the time you get there, you usually have some equipment. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, and posting schedule versus quality. So. 
I, I'm recently struggling that with, uh, with that one myself. Uh, I was trying to keep this vlog weekly, but I found that the quality was terrible, and I'm not, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of a doofus on camera. <laughs> I prefer doing the voiceover with the prepared graphics. Mm. It's harder, but at the same time, it's easier on me in a strange way. More comfortable, so in a sense. I've had to alter the, you know, release regularly versus quality algorithm just mm. recently. We but yeah. Were, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I think um, Chelsea and I talked about this a little bit before mm -hmm. about the algorithm and how often you should post. Is it every other week? I was week? just going to say that, too. <clears throat> yeah. Do you want to explain it since you were the one that, that told me? Um, well, one of, the, uh, one of the panels I went to this year at VidCon, um, they were talking about the algorithm and all the back end of YouTube and all of that stuff. Um, and we were, I was chatting with another friend who's a YouTuber, and she was saying that um, the algorithm is set up in such a way that if you post once every three weeks, like inside of a three-week window, the algorithm favors you, and it'll keep popping you up to other um, people, subscribers, whatever. But if you post after, like, 28 days or something like that, then it, the algorithm works against you. So if you're posting weekly, bi-weekly, or, you know, within three weeks of a window, it, you'll get more momentum than if you post monthly. Huh. Yeah. That... It's really fascinating. Isn't that wild? And the other thing that I'm you like, said that oh, blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing you said that blew my mind was about scheduling posts. Oh yeah, and um, I, I, the person I was talking to is uh, quite successful, so I, I take her words. Um, but she said that scheduled posts are not as pushed as um, instantly, like public posts. So if you schedule a post, it will push your um, it'll like push your video down. But if you make it live and just let it go out whenever you do, it'll push your videos out to more people, more subscribers. Huh. Mm. That so is. She, she never posts. She never schedules her videos, and she posts within a three-week time period. That is interesting. Okay. If that if that helps at all. No, I, I mean. Or if it would, you know. That's really good to know, actually. Um, I actually wondered how how they did that, but okay. Right. At least there's that, that little kind of back-end algorithm tip I learned. Cool. And it's like, oh, it's stressful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and, I mean, some of us that have smaller channels, I don't know how much it matters yet, but like as you grow, like that's going to help you grow mm -hmm. if it's going to be pushing it out to, to more and more people. Right. As a follow-up to, our, I think, our last Hangout, we talked about view velocity, and one of the people did reversing the YouTube algorithm. It's actually, a, he put it as a text post also on TubeFilter, if anyone wants to Google it. I think it's also maybe linked in the last video, I'm not sure. We were talking about view velocity and how, like, the current video you put up, if it doesn't get as many views, it, the next video you put up, they won't put it out to as many people. Oh, so yeah, that's posting, posting more isn't better either because if they're of somewhat good quality and but not as many people watch it, then they won't put the next one out either. Mm -hmm. um, that so works daily about. too. Yeah. Um, so I was talking to my friend, and she said that when she puts a a video out, like on a you know, say a Saturday, if it does well in the next three to like five days, YouTube will push it out more. But if it doesn't do well within like forty eight hours, then they'll push it down. Yeah, there. It. I believe that's exactly the forty eight hour window is when you need the biggest view velocity mm -hmm. in order for it to push it out to more people. Right. So, post every three weeks. I don't know what you could do to get your view velocity up, but 48 hours after the posting is crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then, shoot, man, and I don't know. try not to, don't schedule your posts. Like, yeah. don't schedule your posts. Huh. So yeah. these were some things that we learned at VidCon. <laughs> man, that is a little disconcerting. Man. Right? <laughs> Agreed. And as someone who's been working on like back end 
parts of my videos but hasn't published a video in a couple months because of, you know, life and all the things. I'm like, oh, God, I have to have all these things out so I can make sure I post between <laughs> three weeks and all of that stuff, you know. So, yeah, it's, we're, we're here to change your mind, to change your strategies <laughs> right now. <laughs> Yeah, and, and our next, I, I hope in our next one we're going to talk about, I don't know how much you're looking to grow your channel, but um, one of our next hangouts we're going to talk about doing help, hub, and hero content. So it's how you format your content. So hub is like what you usually post. Help your, is what people are going to be searching for. Like it's S SEO rich. Um, it's usually tutorials, how-tos. That's what people are looking for. And hero would be like your Antarctica stuff, like your actual trip. Like this is a thing that's going to take you months, but, <laughs> but it's going to do a, a view spike and get a lot of people in. So that's that's something I learned recently. So we'll have a whole hangout discussing how to do that. Yeah, and in that vein, um, Brian asks Kyle if you have any videos to plug. We'd love to explore your channel more. What are your favorite videos that you've made? What do you want to plug? Tell people to watch. Um, on my personal channel, uh, the History of Antarctica with Dinosaurs is probably my favorite. Um, there's not that many videos on that channel yet. And that, I mentioned at the beginning that there were three YouTube channels I worked on. Uh, I'm taking the Curio channel, and I'm just going to put that content into my personal channel. Um, and find a happy medium for that. So, on that channel, it's the History of Antarctica. Uh, on Trek Expertise, probably, uh, I did a video on gays, lesbians, in and Star Trek, like how oh, they cool. were represented, nice. and how the franchise talked about them. Uh, that might be my favorite one, or the most recent one, which was uh, how Star Trek won its first Emmy, and it was through a Native American writer working for the animated series in the 70s. Wow. Yeah, yeah so... Those are, those are my favorite. Check those out if you want to watch something. Cool. Thanks. His channel link is in the description for his um, his main channel, and then I believe you have your other channels as featured channels on that page. Yes. Can... Yeah, they all enter link. You can you can uh, find one from the other. Uh, the other channel is trexpertise.com. You could just go to the URL, but uh, uh, yeah, they're all linked together. Cool, we've got friends in the in the chat who are excited to check that out. Please do, please do. And we've been tweeting at you, so if you want to follow his Twitter handle, you can go to WeCreateEDU, and it should be the last probably two or three tweets that we've sent out. Um, is there anywhere else people should follow you? Uh, Twitter's good. Twitter's probably the best. Um, that Twitter's probably the best. I'm on all of them. Uh, okay, oh, good God. <laughs> Do the thing. <laughs> Plug all the things we want to know. Uh, Mio Teotihuacan. Uh, That's why that. I didn't say it, because I didn't had no idea how to say yeah. it. But so people in the chat, too, are like, what's your Twitter? What's your yeah, Instagram? Yeah. We um, want to know. Let's see. If you go to any of the videos, the link for my Twitter handle is in the description on all of them. Um, but it is a it is a strange Mexican-sounding word. <laughs> it, it is also in the... Uh, on your about page, you have right. links to that too. So you can right. go to his YouTube about page. There's lots of ways to find it. So, is there? Do you have any questions for us or the chat? Because we're coming close to an hour. Okay. Um. I don't know. What are you guys going to do next? Not just like uh, the next hangout topic, but like, what is the long-term plan for We Create Edu? So. We have two hangouts a month, and one hangout we're trying to bring in awesome guests like you, and the other one we're going to talk about the topics we just did, like view velocity, um, how to do different uh, types of content, how to set goals, how to do lighting, like whatever whatever we need to talk about. Usually news. We're, I think that's one of uh, the better things that we do is try and tell you, like, you know, new end slates are coming for your videos, hopefully soon. They keep saying it's coming soon. So we're pretty good at updating you about new things in social media. One of the things we hope to get better at is um, promoting each other's content. And because it's very hard, that's the, the biggest struggle for small YouTubers is time and getting exposure. So we would love to promote 
the everybody that we find uh, through our channels. So that's that's the biggest thing that I personally want to work forward with. But this is not my channel; it's a community channel. So whatever goals people come up with. Oh, that reminds me. I'm supposed to plug Matt's other channel. It's everything else. That's the name of the YouTube channel. Um, they are taking guest vloggers on the channel. I believe it's is it Tuesdays? Do you know Chelsea? Um, I, think it's, I am not sure what day. If you go to the channel, they actually they'll show you a, a calendar and one of um, Matt does news update videos. So everything else is a collab channel, but Matt from Conjecture is running. They do hangouts once a month, maybe twice a month, and they have four people that alternate vlogging. And they're looking for more guest vlogs, and they're looking to bring together uh, content creators. So I almost forgot to plug that in. <laughs> so Chelsea, what do you think the future of We Create EDU is like? Um, I mean, I like we've chatted about this before. I think um, I really like the way that we're headed at the moment. Um, I like having somebody to kind of interview and chat with in the community uh, once a month and then have the other hangout be kind of the, you know, back end of YouTube, as it were, um, and kind of figure out what we're troubleshooting and what people need help on or, you know, what's new in the Internet space. Um, so I think if we can kind of do that and do it well for the next couple months, then, um, you know, as we grow and as we kind of come together as a community, if there's other things that pop up and if there's, you know, IRL things. It feels weird to say that because I don't ever speak like that. But if there's, um, <laughs> if there's, you know, real life meetups or hangouts or whatever um, that we can also start doing, I think that would be really great uh, for people who are kind of in the same pockets of wherever we are. I know we have some people um, in Europe, some people in uh, London. I think right outside of London, um, and you know, people all around the states at the moment. So I think if we can potentially in, you know, six months or a year kind of start doing little meet up -y things, I think that would be really fun too. Currently we pretty much just meet up at Nerdfighter things. Not true. Nerdcon, and Vidcon, or Nerdcon yeah. stories or yeah. something like that. Hmm. Interesting. And well, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, and we, we have a Slack that we talk. It's, it's a lot like the Creators Guild Slack, except for there aren't, like, the like giant YouTubers creators. with yeah, there aren't the giant creators. That's I was like, how do I put this nicely? There aren't the giant <laughs> creators in our Slack. We're all kind of figuring it out together. I think maybe the most somebody has a couple thousand, maybe ten or fifteen thousand in our in our Slack. But it's kind of nice that we're all kind of the nice part, yeah. Yeah, they we're all figuring it out together. So very cool. I'm looking forward to uh, to to seeing some of this. Uh, content you guys are talking about. Like I said, I just discovered we create EDU through the guild, so like I'm really happy this exists. Yay, welcome. Come join the Slack. Come be part of our, our funky little community. Should, yeah. <laughs> and if there's anything we can do to help you out, you just let us know. Yeah, I'm sure absolutely. you're going to get a couple more Twitter followers tonight and tomorrow, because a lot of people can't watch this live, so we, we get a lot of views the next day. Yeah. So Perfect. if there's anything you need, if you want us to start, whenever you post your public, all your public content, we'll start tweeting it out to everybody we know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, perfect. Uh, actually, uh, the thing, I have one request. What is the general consensus on what people should do with public domain content? Uh, hmm. Maybe that could be a topic in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, we will we'll bring that up in the Slack and we'll bring it up um, on future Hangouts. Maybe we'll just have a whole Hangout with them um, after we do some more research ourselves yeah. and try and figure out how we could put more more content up there. Because even as Brian pointed out, like he's using a lot of his footage from Alaska for his videos, so maybe he doesn't want that to be in the public domain, but there's a bunch that he's not using that didn't right. fit in his story that he said that he could put on public domain. So we should all think about like, how can we use some of our extra footage to put out there? Yeah. And I don't think it necessarily, like you're saying, sometimes even just New York skyline or something like that. So. Yeah, well, I think that's an interesting point. Um, if there is, you know, a public domain site to be made by a small community like us that can, you know, put up stuff, I don't, or if it's worth it to, to kind of attach to another site that's already established, um, 
But I think you're right. There's a lot of footage. I mean, I even have B-roll footage of things like things around my city and stuff like that that I might not find useful, but other people might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's just sitting on hard drives. Yeah, right. right. No exactly. one's looking at it. Nobody's looking at it. Nobody's using it. Somebody might as well use it. <laughs> that just made me think of, have you ever watched Go Verba Now? Have you ever seen his channel? No. Yeah, he's great. Um, his channel is really, really good. He went around and interviewed a bunch of YouTubers, education YouTubers, and asked them a lot of questions, and they're just like really awesome interviews. But I just remembered, I think one of his first people he interviewed, I think the guy's name was Cable Green, but I could be wrong, but he, his whole thing is Creative Commons and trying to make more stuff public domain so educators can use them. He would probably be a great resource. Yeah. So uh, after this Hangout, so I'm not typing during the last few minutes, I will find that video and I will tweet it to you because Please. that guy's probably going to be the guy to help you because that's what his mission in life is, to make more things, creative commons and public domain. So he's probably going to be able to really help you. Perfect, yeah. Okay, great. So, chat, do you have any final questions? We have to give them a minute because it's a little bit delayed. But thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome, and we're all very, very excited. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It was really fun. And uh, hopefully uh, I can give you guys some penguin footage. <laughs> that's, okay. that's all I'm waiting for is the penguin footage. <laughs> I was at a zoo and I saw a penguin hug a person and I was just like, that's it. Oh. I, I totally want a penguin now. They probably <laughs> smell, though, I would guess. Uh, they smell terrible. Um, it's like, they just smell terrible. Yeah. <laughs> So Brian didn't yeah. have any questions. I'm figuring Matt doesn't either because he doesn't say anything. So thank, thank you, everyone that watched. Um, please go check out his YouTube channel. He's going to be vlogging all his adventures before and during. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> thank you. Yay. Have a good night, everybody.